I want to cut to the chase on what COP21 will do. Do you actually believe that cities can scale to give us a better energy world versus what nations and states can do? Well, that question actually is very, is very interesting, but uh, let me first start by saying that this is a great Earth Day uh, for our stewardship of, of the climate uh, of the Earth. Now, in terms of cities, uh, cities clearly have to play uh, an, an important role. As you, as you know, uh, we're well past now 50% uh, urbanization globally. We'll be at 70% probably by, by mid-century. And cities do present uh, interesting opportunities uh, precisely because of their, of their density. Uh, certainly, uh, we could see uh, much, much greater electrification of cities uh, served by carbon-free sources. Uh, we can see opportunities for efficiency uh, in how people live. Uh, so cities are, are, are going to play a critical role. And another issue which has been emphasized recently uh, is how uh, urban areas and the networking of urban areas in different regions uh, can play a very important part uh, in going to a low-carbon future. I like the idea of networking of urban areas. Have you seen a change in your tenure within the climate deniers? There are people out there that just flat out say Jeff Sachs is wrong, Ernest Moniz is wrong, COP21's wrong. Have they changed their tone over the last, say, two years? I think so. But let me also say that uh, my very first uh, day, I guess even before being on the job formally, uh, I made it clear that I did not come to Washington to debate what's not debatable. Uh, I'm happy to debate, of course, exactly how we implement our programs to address climate change. Uh, now, I do think there is a shift, uh, and that shift uh, is driven by the realities of what the public is seeing, uh, the realities that uh, certainly polls show uh, the public uh, clearly uh, understanding uh, that we need to address climate change. Uh, again, we still have uh, debates going on about what exactly to do, how to do it. Uh, we clearly have uh, different regional questions that need to be addressed, but it, it right. is not credibly debatable that we, uh, we need to be prudent uh, and address climate change uh, in, a, in a strong way. So, Secretary Moniz, do you expect to ratify the agreement from Paris, not just sign it, but ratify it before President Obama's term is up? Well, again, today, as, you, as you've said, uh, what we will see is the vast majority of countries signing on to the agreement. Uh, there's a second step that involves internal processes uh, to, uh, to denote acceptance. The United States and China have announced that both of us uh, plan to reach that stage this year. So the answer is yes. Uh, we are going through the internal processes uh, to reach acceptance uh, this year. How do you get from the current deal, pledges on the table adding up to three degrees of warming, to the below two degrees actually signed on? Well, the Paris Accord, uh, in my view, is a very, very major first step. Uh, it's a first step because, uh, as you've implied, uh, ex uh, exercising uh, our programs internationally uh, will, again, bring down global warming expectations dramatically, but by themselves, they will not get us uh, below two degrees. There's no, there's no question there. Uh, but that's why the agreement also has uh, five-year review periods, uh, why there is the anticipation of greater ambition uh, in the future. And one of the critical issues there uh, rests on another uh, Paris, uh, Paris discussion uh, being implemented, namely something called mission innovation. Uh, that's where 20 countries uh, have come together and pledged to seek a doubling of energy uh, R&D, right. United States am among them. Uh, and we believe that that will lead uh, to more innovation, that will lead to more cost reduction, and more cost reduction uh, will lead to more ambition. Uh, Mr. Secretary, let me bring in Jeffrey Sachs of Columbia University with a question for you. Jeff? First, I want to say uh, how nice it is to be with you, Mr. Secretary, it, and it's nice that hey, Jeff. Am America has one of uh, the smartest people in our country as uh, Secretary of Energy. It's, it's really a, a great thing. Uh, Ernie, I, I wonder if you could say a word about the nuclear future uh, in our country. That's a low-carbon energy source. It provides still a substantial part of our electricity, highly controversial. Uh, many of us think it needs to be part of a low-carbon future for the U.S. How do you see the politics and the thinking and the technology on this now? This is an area of your great expertise. 
Well, certainly, uh, we, uh, the President uh, and I, uh, agree, uh, need to keep nuclear on the table as an option, uh, as essentially a zero-carbon option uh, for the future. Uh, the challenge with nuclear power, at least a major challenge of nuclear power, is that with uh, today's reactors, uh, certainly, there's a very, very large upfront capital cost, uh, although a, a comparatively low operating cost. Uh, given the, that capital structure, what we are seeing is new reactors being built uh, in the southeast, uh, where uh, the, the rate recovery uh, mechanisms uh, are operative. Uh, we will see uh, how that uh, propagates across the country. But you mentioned technology, and as one example of something that uh, I certainly think it's very important for us uh, to see through uh, is the development of much smaller so-called modular reactors. Indeed, uh, the Department of Energy has helped support now uh, a company on that, and they will be submitting a design certification. It's a 50 megawatt well, rather than, say, a 1,200 megawatt reactor. They will submit this year to the NRC.